Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Reference Recordings. And today we're talking about the Brahms Piano Concertos, sets, both of them, as cycles. This is really a little tricky. And again, like all of these 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 talks, and I keep repeating this over and over again, so much of the interest is getting to probe the discographic history of these pieces and see why the reference became the reference. And this is really a very interesting, interesting story because there were lots of opportunities for reference recordings, but somehow um, we never really coalesced. The consensus never quite coalesced until we got to... Joachim and Gillels on Deutsche Grammophon. Now, these were recorded in 1972. Um, and, yeah, 1972. And, you know, I, that's a long time to wait, you think, for major works of Brahms. But not when you understand where we were with them um, and what the history was. Because in addition to having a reference recording for the pair, there are also reference recordings for each concerto individually. And... Therein lies a tale. So let's let's go through it just a little bit. Let's start. First of all, the two concertos were never equally popular. Number two was always more popular than number one. Um, and as a result of that, there were usually more recordings of number two out there, whereas number one was considered something, a little bit of a specialty piece. Now, in the 1950s and early 60s, the market for number one was dominated not by a pianist, but by a conductor, by George Sell, who recorded it with Clifford Curzon on Decca, Rudolf Serkin, and Leon Fleischer. All of them. And he owned the accompaniment to Brahms Concerto Number 1. He really did. I mean, it was really extraordinary. And so you had to get one of them with Sell. But the three pianists who were all excellent, really first-rate musicians, and they were competing with themselves in some respects because, well, Fleischer only did it once, of course, but Serkin did them twice. He did them with Sal and he did them with Ormandy. And Ormandy was no slouch either, even in the first. He was a wonderful Brahms conductor, terribly underrated. And of course, one of the great accompanists that ever lived. And so, and so these performances which were very, very highly regarded by everybody. I mean, even if people didn't like Fleischer because he was America, they, they could like Serkin and certainly Clifford Curzon. And then other people did the second, for example, Sviatoslav Richter. I mean, Richter did the second, but not the first. So it was very hard to come to a consensus on what the best Brahms concerto cycle was. You, you were, there were many choices for individual performances. And of course, those will be the subject of future videos. Um, believe you me, they shall. But really, it was a complicated thing. So, so th that's what sort of dominated the universe in the 60s. Of course, there were others too. There was always Claudio Aral. There were other great pianists recording these pieces. But, you know, Claudio Aral, one of the, your, the commentators always said, why haven't you mentioned Claudio Aral for these like solo works that we were talking about? And I, I, I was thinking about that because he's like one of my favorite pianists ever. And I love like his entire Phillips legacy, I think is stunning. And there are some amazing pieces, which, you know, performances which could well serve as references. But there was also a school that regarded him as excessively serious, um, somewhat four square and, and for that reason, I, I, he just never seemed to get the sort of universal acclaim that he probably deserved. First of all, he wasn't terribly four square, but he was very serious. And he was extremely concerned with beauty of tone. He had a very special sound. Um, it wasn't to all tastes. Let's just put it that way. Um, and that's just the way it was. There's no arguing with it. It's a fact. It's what it was, but he was amazing. So he recorded these works. Lots of people were doing that. It, wasn't, it was a shortage. It's just that it was hard to come to a consensus pick until these showed up. And this really, this was really a, a wonderful moment, I think, in discographic history because I had been reading reviews. Now, when this, these showed up in, in what, 72, I was only, I was only 12, 11 or 12. So I, I didn't know anything about these pieces. I really didn't. 
Um, I only started paying attention several years, obviously, later when I was in my late teens, but that wasn't such a long time after these came out. And I went back because I was always curious about things. You know, our library had all the old high fidelities and stereo reviews and gramophones and all that stuff. And I went back, I read reviews. And, you know, when I started to learn French, I started reading them in French and I tried to learn them. When I learned German, I read them in German. You know, I, I went back and I wanted to see what people were saying. And the fascinating thing about what I discovered when, you know, sort of doing this as part of my work as an actual critic and having to, you know, pick reference recordings and come out with things like this was that when these came out, everything just coalesced around them. You know, all of the, there were wonderful reviews of lots of other performances and people were recommending Brahms cycles, but this was the one that really solidified the, the universe of classical music critics and I think listeners also. You know, Joachim was the most underrated Brahms conductor who ever lived because his Brahms is stunning. It's as great as anybody's. And he did two Brahms cycles. There's the mono one with Berlin and then the, the stereo one with, what is it, London Phil or the Philharmonic? It's London Phil, I think. Um, and, or the London Symphony, one or the other. I, I don't remember, but it doesn't matter. It was on EMI, um, now Warner. And they're, they're great. They're just incredibly... He had... You know, Fort, Fling, Fort Wengler's flexibility of pulse with none of his problems with orchestral discipline um, and pulling an orchestra together. And my God, these things were great. So when he did the accompaniments, you knew that, first of all, you had a conductor who was every bit as, as, as worthy of the music, worthy as a partner in these incredibly symphonic concerti where the piano and the orchestra are on an absolutely equal basis throughout. Um, you had an ideal Brahms conductor and Gilles. Well, Gilles was a legend. He wasn't Richter, of course. He was considered to be sort of more more uh, sturdy and sober and kind of grumpy, <laughs> you know. But his Beethoven was the German standards were his thing, Beethoven and Brahms. So it was it was going to be exciting to hear him do the two Brahms concerti, and indeed it was. And to do them with Joachim, you just finally had a pairing that was going to be able to deliver equally fabulous results in both concertos. You know, I mean, remember, remember the controversy over Polini's first Brahms cycle. The second concerto was with Abado. The first was with Carl Böhm. And I remember everybody dumping all over Carl Böhm because they said he was just German, four square, stodgy. I actually liked Böhm because, because the piece is a little German and four square and stodgy. And because, and because Böhm did bring out that grim, dogged, granitic is the word, right? Element in the music that I thought was fine. But for that reason, because Polini's had two separate conductors, um, he, he, you know, there was a lot of, of preference giving. Some people preferred the first, most people preferred the second. You know, the two of them didn't quite come together as a unified package. I mean, that's kind of what happened with these pieces. Really kind of remarkable when you consider that there are only two of them. But it, it, they are such different works and and they require, you know, a pianist of extraordinary depth of sensibility and a conductor who can be an absolute equal partner all the way through. It was a tough job. And um, I just am... It was a moment. I just remember it like it was yesterday, just reading all these reviews and all of a sudden everyone, aha, <laughs> the reference recording, Joachim Gilles. Now, since then, there have been a bazillion Brahms cycles and some of them have just been excellent. You know, you had like, who was it? Uh, Harnacord and Buchbinder and you had Nelson Freire and, and, and Shai and you had, you know, I mean, some really, really fine things popping around in addition to marvelous individual, you know, singleton performances. So it was very easy for this to get swallowed up in the ensuing flood. Because remember, the 70s were the beginning of that insane period, 20, 30 years, when the industry just went nuts and recorded everybody doing everything that they possibly could over and over and over and over and over. And it was very hard to keep track of what the best versions were or what the reference recording was because the consensus that coalesced around these performances proceeded to fragment afterwards. That's what happens. That's what happens with this stuff. So if you didn't catch this when it came out, trust me, this was a moment.
it was a historical moment in the discography of the Brahms Piano Concerti. And and um, if you listen to these, you will very, very readily understand why. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care. <laughs>